This is CBN News Watch. And thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ephraim Graham. President Trump faces a new wave of pressure to stick with the Iran nuclear deal. The leaders of both France and Germany will visit the White House this week, urging the president not to withdraw as he has vowed to do. By May 12th, Heather Sells has that story. President Trump has promised to walk away from the Iran nuclear deal by May 12th, unless co-signers France, Germany and Britain fix what he says are its serious flaws. Both the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, and the German chancellor, Angela Merkel, will visit the U.S. this week, urging the president to save the deal. The 2015 agreement curbs Iran's nuclear program. Macron told Fox News it's not perfect, but argues there's no good plan B. What do you have as a better option? I don't see it. The president might just listen to Macron. The two have bonded over their shared maverick reputations, and the White House recently thanked France for joining the U.S. military in airstrikes against alleged chemical weapons facilities in Syria. The Iranian foreign minister is also warning against scraping the deal, saying if the U.S. quits it, Iran could actually ramp up its nuclear program. We have put a number of options for ourselves, and those options are ready, uh, including options that would involve uh, resuming at a much greater speed our uh, nuclear uh, activities. At the same time, the president and others are dealing with another international nuclear issue as they prepare for a summit with North Korea's Kim Jong-un and tamping down expectations. On Sunday, the president tweeted maybe things will work out and maybe they won't. And the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee stated denuclearization is unrealistic. Senator Bob Corker believes Kim Jong-un has no motivation to give up his nuclear ambitions. To think that somebody's going to go in and charm him out of that uh, is not realistic. Is there some progress that can be made? I hope so. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, that's a big hurdle. The president does have some leverage. A senior administration official told the Wall Street Journal that the U.S. will not substantially lift sanctions against North Korea unless it significantly dismantles its nuclear programs. Over the weekend, Kim Jong-un said he's closing North Korea's nuclear test site and suspending long-range missile tests to promising signs ahead of his summit with President Trump. The president will soon have to make his final decisions on how to negotiate both with North Korea and on the Iranian deal. Heather Sells, CBN News. An urgent manhunt is still underway for the suspect accused of gunning down four people at a Waffle House restaurant in Tennessee. Police say the suspect, Travis Renking, was nearly naked and brandishing an assault-style rifle when he opened fire in the parking lot and then stormed the restaurant. Four people were killed, four others injured, and he is still on the loose. Police are warning residents that he is likely armed. Area schools are not allowing visitors in today as a precaution. The man who snatched the weapon from Ryan King during the Waffle House shooting says, in the moment, it was life or death. You have to do this now, or it's not going to be, if, if, if I let him load that weapon, it wasn't going to be another window. It wasn't going to be another chance. More details have surfaced on Ryan King, troubled past and possible mental illness, including an arrest last year by the Secret Service for trespassing near the White House. Police say, police say that they confiscated his weapon during that investigation, including an AR-15 that he allegedly used at the Waffle House. But investigators say Ryan King's father got those guns back and gave them back to his son. Here's a look now at some of the headlines we're following for you in the CBN newsroom today. Nearly 60 people are dead and another 100 wounded after a suicide bombing attack in the capital of, of Afghanistan. The bomber attacked a voter registration center in Kabul Sunday. Police say civilians who were registering for national identification cards were the main target. The Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for that attack. Back here in the U.S., thousands came together to honor the life of Barbara Bush over the weekend. The President Obama and First Lady uh, um, Michelle Obama, as well as the Clintons and First Lady Melania Trump, attended the funeral services in Houston Saturday. Her son Jeb Bush and close friends praised the, their beloved mother and grandmother during the emotional eulogies. 
Gas prices are on the rise again. The national average for a gallon of gas is now up to $2.75 a gallon. That's 37 cents above where it was just a year ago. Experts say as we get closer to Memorial Day, it is expected to rise even higher. You can find these and other stories throughout the day at CBNNews.com. Mike Pompeo, President Donald Trump's pick to be his next Secretary of State, faces a big vote in the Senate today. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee is poised to vote on his nomination. But unless someone changes their mind, he doesn't have enough votes to be recommended favorably to the full Senate. Republican Senator Rand Paul and all Democrats on the committee oppose his nomination, citing his hawkish views on foreign affairs and his personal opposition to gay marriage. New Jersey Senator Cory Booker specifically called out Pompeo's Christian views on marriage during committee hearings. The full Senate can still approve Pompeo's nomination, even if this committee turns him down. Congress recently passed a law to stop U.S. taxpayer dollars from going to the Palestinian Authority if they keep giving money to convicted terrorists and their families. But it looks like the Palestinians haven't given up their practice known as pay to slay. The law called, called the Taylor Force Act, named after a U.S. citizen who was murdered by Palestinian terrorists in Israel. Chris Mitchell brings us this story now on the Palestinian response to this warning from America. When the Taylor Force Act became law, Congress expected the Palestinian Authority to get the message. CBN News spoke by phone with Congressman Doug Lamborn, who introduced the legislation to the House of Representatives. It says a strong signal that we're not going to stand by when they take U.S. taxpayer dollars and turn around and give it to terrorists who have murdered innocent people. Yet PA President Mahmoud Abbas ignored any signs, blatantly refusing to honor the new law, even though it could mean millions in lost aid. <laughs> The Palestinians are taking a hard line and they are defying the U.S. We should stop every single penny that goes to them until they change their policy. Rewarding terrorists and their families has been built into the fabric of Palestinian society as well as its budget for decades. According to the Meir Amit Intelligence Center, this year is no different. For 2018, the Palestinian Authority still allocated about $360 million or 7% of its budget for this practice. The PA has budgeted this amount of money for the past six years. In the past, the PA disguised the sources of those payments. Now the funds are openly included in the 2018 budget, a move some interpret as clear defiance. Itamar Marcus of the Palestinian Media Watch first reported on payments to terrorists by the PA in 2011. The great tragedy of, I would say, the last 20 years is that the Palestinian Authority acted like a terror organization. They sent terrorists to kill Israelis. They rewarded them. Lamborn hopes other nations will follow the U.S. lead. We would strongly hope that other countries would follow our lead, just as we hope they follow our lead in other areas like moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. If the international community united says to the Palestinians, if you act like a terrorist, you're not going to get our money, you'll be treated like a terrorist. I think that could have a very good long-term effect on changing the way the Palestinian Authority behaves. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up, fighting the culture war. See how Christians are working to become relevant again. A Minneapolis area school bus driver says his rights to free speech and religion were violated when he got taken off his route for leading students in prayer. Area school officials say bus drivers are given time for personal prayer, but leading children is not a part of the job. The driver, George Nathaniel, said he never forced the students to pray, and a lot of the time they would volunteer to lead the prayer. Nathaniel is also an area church pastor who was apparently fired from another bus for another bus driving job four years ago in a neighboring city for the very same reason. If you follow the news, you likely know that the culture war is the battle over moral values in our society. And as Paul Strand reports, the culture war also has a spiritual dimension.
not just people, whole nations. At this Orlando conference, top Christian speaker Lance Wallnow explained one way for believers to capture a nation is to conquer the seven mountains of culture. Culture isn't just what's in our museums or what you watch on TV. If we were fish, culture is the ocean we swim in. These mountains described by Wallnow are government, media, education, business, religion, family, and arts and entertainment. Wallnow argues just winning souls one by one is not enough. Stop thinking of our assignment as merely soul winning or seeing, having experiences with God. We should be seeing um, the fact that we are literally a kingdom invading force going into all the world. And if you see darkness, that's where you should go because the church should be going where the gates of hell are located. While now believes God has put in most Christians a desire and ability to take on these mountains of culture. And my prayer is that everyone listening to this will find the assignment God created them for and that it will, uh, it will consume you. Just be bold and ask God to take you. Film producer Rick Eldridge is taking the challenge. Of course, our culture is in trouble. And, and I think we as Christians have a responsibility to uh, make a difference in that culture. He says the way to get to the top and be an influencer is becoming one of the best at what you do. As Proverbs 22:29 puts it, do you see a man skilled in his work? He will stand before kings. Eldridge says it's certainly true on the mountain of arts and entertainment. As we, we infiltrate that industry with a high caliber and quality of excellence in what we do, and a high cal cal caliber and quality of our faith, living and working in that, will touch lives. It's time for the show. That Christian and journalist Lee Stranahan hosts a three-hour talk show, Fault Lines, put on by the Russian network Sputnik. Well, I do, but, the, but the, the Russians don't tell me what to say. He's desperate for Christians to run up the media mountain. I don't think there's just a place for Christians in journalism. I think they have to be there. Stranahan says that's because he believes mainstream news media operate without any moral compass. But the only way to combat that really is with principles. Like presenting truth based in reality, not political correctness. Walnow says the mainstream media and the left use PC language to present Christianity as a religion of bigotry and hateful discrimination. You know you've lost culture war when the power to define the meaning of words has shifted. So what is a couple? What is an American? What is hate speech? Those in charge of the culture get to define the meaning of words, concepts, institutions. So in other words, pretty much what you think. And that's why a war over the culture is a war over everything. Thus, while now's belief, God wants his people to capture the mountains of culture. Because God wants to take territory in these systems. Stranahan says he knows it's not PC to suggest everyone would be better off living in a Christian nation, but his reporting in the Middle East and war-torn regions showed him that it's true. And this is before I came to Christ. I realized that countries are safer and more peaceful when they're Christian. The people there, their lives would be better. Again, I'm not even having a theological debate here. Their actual, there would be less people killed by the state. They would be freer women would have a better life, and they would not be trying to wage war on other countries. And that's why Walnow believes Christians should accept leaders like Donald Trump, Winston Churchill, or Abe Lincoln, leaders who may not be evangelicals, but fight for biblical principles. I don't care if it's a believer or an unbeliever, so long as their principles align with the wisdom and counsel of God, and it's like good physics. If it's the right principles, it'll incur a blessing. That could help disciple the nations for Christ and even eventually fulfill Isaiah 2 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Paul Strand, CBN News, Orlando. Still ahead, finding God in the mountains, see how this man grew in his faith by hiking the Appalachian Trail. Every year, thousands attempt to hike the entire Appalachian Trail from start to finish. Only one in four, though, actually complete it. When Paul Stutzman took his first steps on the more than 2,000-mile trek, he wanted more than a great adventure. He was looking for an encounter with God. A Wendy Griffith brings us the story. Paul Stutzman lived a great life, happily married, three children, and a great job managing a large restaurant in Ohio's Amish country. Then in 2002, doctors diagnosed his beloved wife, Mary, with breast cancer. Although they did everything they could and believed God would heal her, Mary passed away four years later. 
This devastated Paul, leaving him consumed with a burning question for God. Where were you when my wife died? A year after Mary's death, and still with no answer, Paul knew he had to do something different. And I just felt God saying, it's time, give it up, go on the trail, and I'm gonna meet you there. So Paul quit his job and started his journey on the famous Appalachian Trail, nearly 2,200 miles of rugged wilderness that begins in Springer Mountain, Georgia, and passes through 14 states, ending in Mount Katahdin, Maine. What was going through your mind those nights in the shelter? The first night on the Appalachian Trail, I'm in my tent and I'm laying there, I can't sleep because it's raining and I just gave up a good job to get out here in the woods getting rained on. And so I just sort of reflected back on my life and, and how I'd grown up. And I just told God that night, you're going to be my hiking partner and I want to know some, I want answers and I want to know more about grace. How long did the journey take you? I had planned on six months, but uh, growing up the way I did Amish and then Mennonite, we have a strong work ethic. And so I'd get up early in the morning and I'd just hike all day and I ended up doing it in four and a half months, which is pretty fast. What did you average every day on the trail? My average on the whole uh, hike was 17 and a half miles a day, but that includes eight days where I took a zero day, which means a day off. Everybody on the trail has a trail name. What was your trail name? I picked the trail name Apostle. And I took that name, obviously my name is Paul, so I was the Apostle Paul. And 500 miles up the trail is Damascus, Virginia. So I was the Apostle Paul heading to Damascus. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite state? Uh, I enjoyed Virginia, especially. Virginia is the longest state of, of, of the states, probably about 600 miles. Uh, but it's not quite as difficult as perhaps like uh, Georgia or New Hampshire and Maine. But the scenery coming over the Shenandoah National Park, the scenery is just gorgeous in Virginia. During his first month on the trail, Paul lost 30 pounds and got in the best shape of his life. But the average person burns 2,000 calories a day. A hiker on the Appalachian Trail would burn 6,000. So you can't eat enough. And so about once a week, I'd hitchhike into town because I had food boxes sent to me about every 100 miles. So I'd go to a post office and get my food box. And then since I'm in town, I go to a restaurant and hopefully they have a buffet because oh, you can just eat and eat and eat and eat <laughs> and then get a motel room and get a shower. And a shower and a warm bed is such a luxury after you've been out in the woods for 10 nights, sleeping in a tent and in a sleeping bag. Paul, how did walking in the woods day after day, sleeping in shelters, getting rained on, going hungry sometimes, how did all that help you heal after your wife died? I was exhausted. My body was exhausted, but my mind was becoming very sharp and in focus. And as the farther I would hike and the, the, and the more tired I got, the more clear my mind became. And I started seeing a purpose in what God was doing as I'm meeting people. Day after day, Paul cried out to God. Then on a Sunday morning, somewhere in New Hampshire, he finally got his answer. He took me on my face in tears when he revealed to me why I was on this trail. And God said, you're writing a book, put this message in the book. While it wasn't the personal message he was hoping and expecting, Paul saw it as a word for everyone. Jesus is coming back. What I heard was that I had to take your wife to get you out here in this mountainside to hear that message. And tell people that I, I am coming back. I am control. I know what's going on. And what would you tell to people that are maybe even now going through the loss of a spouse? It does get better. It takes time. And time it, with time, the healing comes. And I think it's, it's good to know, though, grieving means we love somebody. The only way not to grieve is not to love. Our loved ones want us to go on with life. You know, they, they've got it made. They're in heaven, they're just having a ball. But they want us to enjoy life. And there's a lot to, there's a lot to enjoy. And you actually thought about what would be on your tombstone at the end of your life. Would I just want it to say, I worked all of my life at a restaurant and passed away? Or would I want it to say, he took a chance, he took a risk, and he quit his job, and he hiked the Appalachian Trail. And it, I decided I wanted to read that way. Wendy Griffith, CBN News. Oh, what a beautiful story and a wonderful encounter with God. Stay with us. We'll be right back. It is time now for your Monday motivation. And today I'd love to leave you with this simple message. Nothing is too hard for God. Absolutely nothing is too hard for God. It's a simple truth, but with it comes a measurable blessing. With that word, be sure to make this a marvelous Monday.
Remember, you can always find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. And we'd love to hear what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can do that by emailing newswatch at CBN.com. And of course, you can always reach us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hope you'll join us again right here next time. Make this a marvelous Monday. We'll see you right back here. Come tomorrow. Goodbye and God bless.